welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Cam, we are joined this week by someone very special. That's right, we are. She needs no introduction because she didn't give us one to give. <laughs> <laughs> it's Kay. Hello. <laughs> I, I should be more official. Uh, Kay Andrew Kuhn, she is the mother of my better half, Hannah, uh, and also loves a bit of the Hitchcock film. So I thought, what better thing to do than bring her on for this film? And I'm really pleased to be here. And thank you very much for having me. We have to issue a formal apology because we know you wanted uh, the 39 steps and Scott and I were a little ditzy that week and completely forgot. That's okay. That's not a problem. (laughs) She's too nice to hate us, I think, but uh, I'm sure she'll find a way to make some jokes at our expense during this episode. Um, I will do my very, very best. (laughs) We're more than deserving of them. (laughs) Um, So before we chat about the film, Kate, we always ask our guests a couple of quick questions about their favourite films and favourite spy films. Okay. So, I mean, do you have any particular connection to spy films? Any any particular favourites? Um, no, not not sort of standout favourites. Um, I I particularly I I was very keen to do this because I um I do like a bit of film noir. I love I love black and white films. Um. I, I like the fact the way that the old films are more kind of plot and character driven. I'm not such a big fan of the um, car chase shoot 'em up kind of uh, some of the some of the modern ones. Um, I'm quite partial to a, a bit of a spoof, and um, I really I really like Austin Powers. <laughs> Sorry to admit <laughs> that, but I um, I I love I love a bit of that. Um, I really, one of the ones, more recent ones, I guess, um, I really liked Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. I thought that was, that was absolutely fabulous. Um, I like the James Bond films. Um, I really like Daniel Craig, um, although I'm old enough to remember, you know, all of the Bonds, really. But, um, so, you know, I like, I like some of those for, for different reasons. If you had to pick a favourite Bond, I mean, you mentioned Daniel Craig. Uh, would that be your go-to, or do you have I, a favourite? Um, well, you got to love a bit of Sean Connery, haven't you? And and he's he's always was kind of the Bond for my kind of youth, I, I suppose. Um, but I I do really like Daniel Craig, and I I really like the um, the way the newer films are quite not as gadgety and a bit sort of grittier, and uh, I think he brings something really uh, interesting to the role. It's not, not maybe not as cartoony as some of them, if you know what I mean. So what you're saying is Moonraker isn't your favourite James Bond movie. <laughs> it it isn't, no. <laughs> probably Once they not. went to space, they went too far. Probably. I mean, I like space stuff. You don't get me wrong, you know, I you know, but uh it it's it's not my favourite one. Well, it's actually worth mentioning as well, Cam. K is a massive Trekkie too. Oh wow! Well, there you go. Well, that, yeah, you know, I, uh, yeah, I, I do. I, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I love, I love Star Trek. <laughs> and uh, she liked Discovery and Picard, so we have nothing more to talk about on that subject. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. End um, of. <laughs> yeah, that's that. That's it. I'm just curious, Kay, um, where do you come down on the works of Hitchcock? Are you a fan? Do you have any favorite Hitchcock movies? You know, before we talk about this week's movie. Um, I, I don't like the, um, the horror ones particularly. Um, right. So like Psycho, so, for example. Um, no, I can, I can see that they're, you know, they're very well done, uh, you know, don't patronize Alfred Hitchcock, you know. Uh, I, yes, I, I can see the, uh, how well they're, you know, there are good things about them, but I don't enjoy those. I, I mean, I have seen, I think I've probably seen Psycho. Um, uh, but um, the, yeah, the kind of the, you know, the classic sort of kind of spy ones at North by Northwest, um, 39 Steps. You know, I, I really, I, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like all those. Right. 
where do you come down on um, sort of the tone of his movies? Do you appreciate the ones that are a little more comedic or the ones that are more serious? Or are you good with either one, just depending on whether they're good or not? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Like I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in um, the plot and the characters and how, uh, how he tells the story. I mean, I've, um, I've, I've done some writing um, for the stage, really not, not screenplays, but when I, when I write, um i see it in my head like a film so i'm mm -hmm. you know it, it's kind of um really important is, is how you how you tell the story and a lot of things um somebody's watching uh they don't actually they don't see that they they're aware of it but they're, they're not aware do you know i'm a bit um confused how i'm trying to explain this there's there's ways of of portraying something that the audience are unaware of how you're doing it. Well, I think that brings us beautifully, Cam, onto what we're doing this week. That's right. We're doing 1946's Notorious, starring Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman, and um, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, the man of the hour. Yeah, I, again, it's one of those Hitchcock films I hadn't seen, but I barely had seen any of his work. Uh, but before we get into that, I will read out the letterbox.com synopsis. Now, we've had a trend recently of some of these older films having very very long uh synopses any bets this one can be summed up very quickly this better not be more than about five sentences okay are you familiar with our letterbox.com i've obviously game? listened to your podcast regularly so well <laughs> we have one listener there we go <laughs> <laughs> all right here we go notorious notorious woman of affairs adventurous man of the world in order to help bring Nazis to justice, U.S. government agent T.R. Devlin recruits Alicia Huberman, the American daughter of a convicted German war criminal, as a spy. And as they begin to fall for one another, Alicia is instructed to win the affections of Alexander Sebastian, a Nazi hiding out in Brazil. When Sebastian becomes serious about his relationship with Alicia, the stakes get higher and Devlin must watch her slip further undercover. I kind of like the slip further undercover. That's pretty badass, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, there was no comma there. I did that myself. Oh, well, <laughs> nonetheless, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I think that was too long. Yeah, it's a little bit long, but it's okay. It's B, like B, B plus, B, somewhere in there. Um, well, okay, I hadn't seen this film, so I'll stay out of this bit. But Kay, you're our guest. Had you seen this one before? I don't think I had, no. It does look like the kind of film that has been, has been played on TV before, though. Like, I feel like I might have missed it at some point. Yes, I think, I think so. I'm sure, it, I'm sure it's been on at some point in the last 50 years. But, I, yeah, maybe I didn't fancy it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, Cam, you, I believe you have it already on Blu-ray. So what did you know? Yeah. So I watched this movie some years ago, probably in my early 20s, late teens, when I went on a spree of watching Hitchcock movies. And I enjoyed it very much at the time. And I remember Roger Ebert was a huge fan of Notorious. I think he called it like one of the 10 best films of all time. And so I remember going into it with that knowledge and, you know, coming out of it being like, well, I didn't like it as much as Psycho or, you know, North by Northwest. But I also think that had more to do with my age than the actual content of the movie. And I, as we get into this movie talking about it, it's a much more, I think, sophisticated, uh, elegant movie than maybe a psycho is. And so I'm just not sure I was ready for what Notorious was giving me when I was relatively young, but I did enjoy it. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll save what I think about it until we get into it. But um, I'm always keen to hear how these films came to be, Cam. So what have you got for us this week? Right. Okay. So this movie, um, the source of its inspiration seems to be a little muddled um, in terms of the telling. Hitchcock has said he was wanting to do a Matahari type concept for a movie. And Scott, we know all about Matahari. I'm dressed as her right now. <laughs> I was dancing all night long. <laughs> Um, the other source of inspiration, they say, came from a 1921 Saturday Evening Post story, short story called The Song of the Dragon by John Tainter Foote um, about a woman who's gathering info from her enemies through sex. And so this story got a 
you know, it had, it had a bit of a sensation around it. People were reading it. And it, apparently the name of this story was tossed around among um, writer Ben Hecht, who came on board to develop this concept and Hitchcock, as well as some of the producers. So it was something kind of in the air. Um, and uh, that story was inspired by a woman named uh, Martha Richard, who in World War I had gone through a s- similar thing, going trying to get enemy information by sleeping with them. And I believe... It was rumored she was a prostitute, but she later on was instrumental in closing down bordellos. It gets very complicated. Look for that in our Martha Hards episode. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, um, Ben Hecht, the writer who's brought on to flesh out this idea. I He's one of those guys, I recognized his name because he's written a, you know, a number of films. He's worked with Hitchcock on movies like um, Strangers on a Train and Rope and uh, The Paradigm Case in uncredited roles. Um Actually, he was credited on those. Sorry, he was uncredited on Lifeboat and Foreign Correspondent. But when I actually look up his IMDb, and I I recommend anyone go look up Ben Hecht's um, IMDb page for his writing credits. He's basically written or had some sort of uncredited role on every classic movie ever made. Like this guy was the go-to guy. He had major credits on the original version of Scarface, uh, Gunga Din with Cary Grant, Wuthering Heights. This guy had done a lot. He even had an uh, uncredited role, I believe, on the 1967 Casino Royale, Scott. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> so is he like a script doctor, then? Is that basically his job? Yeah, he was, a, he was a screenwriter, so he did win Oscars for writing Underworld and The Scoundrel, two films uh, from 27 and then 36. But uh, he would also do a lot of uncredited work as well, kind of banging scripts into shape. So he was just a guy who was incredibly prolific. Like just worked constantly, so yes, he he's he's everything. Basically, he helped form a lot of the uh, classic cinema as we know it. Okay, so that's got some good credentials going into it. Oh yeah, and so he was signed for five thousand a week to work on this project, and him and Hitchcock put together a fifty-page treatment in just three weeks. So it shows that like the wheels were really turning on this one. These guys had a concept that they liked. Five grand a week. Yeah. Man, right? I'll take that now. I'll take that now. <laughs> yeah, that's in 1946. What is that now? I don't even know. I'd have to look that up, but that that's quite... He was doing well. He was doing quite well for himself. Hmm. Oh, to be fair, that's quite a deadline, though. Three weeks to have a 50-page like outline? Yeah, 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 that's pretty good, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think the general story came together very quickly, but the uranium plot element was added... Um, months before the atomic bomb tests in New Mexico, somehow it occurred to them that there was rumors around that there was a U.S. testing to do with, um, you know, atomic bombs. No one really quite knew exactly what was going on, but they knew something was going on. And um, so Hitchcock and Ben Hecht went to Dr. Robert Milliken, who worked on Cosmic Rays and wanted to know, how would you make an atomic bomb? And he was like, I'm not answering any of your questions. And that's how they got on a watch list. Exactly. Hitchcock wound up on an FBI surveillance list for weeks. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I don't know if that's true. And I feel like Hitchcock may have played up the story because apparently he was greatly pleased with this story. So who knows? I like to think he was, though, because it's just more fun. Oh, wait, were were you telling the truth? I was joking. No, he was. He Hitchcock said to the end of his days that he was being surveillanced by the uh, FBI afterwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> All yeah. right, fair enough. Yeah. Huh. So this movie was produced initially by David O. Selznick, who was one of the big heavyweights in the studio industry in those days. But somewhere along the line, um, he was Selznick was also making a movie called Duel in the Sun. And Duel in the Sun was with um, Gregory Peck, who'd starred actually in Hitchcock's previous film, um, Spellbound. And Duel in the Sun had gone sort of into complications. It was over budget. It was running a bit late. And it was deemed a very important project. So Selznick decided to pull out of Notorious somewhat. He sold the project to Archeo for $800,000 um, but and plus 50% of the gross. So RKO took it over. And this became Hitchcock's first U.S. producer credit because um, previous to that, he was more of a studio guy. At this point, he gets more creative control. And RKO was very artist friendly and said, you know what? We like what you're doing. Go ahead. 
Um, the only issues was them grappling with the Hayes Code, who were quite strict on this movie. There was some rewrites because, and I love this quote from the Hayes Code, they were very concerned because it deals with, and I quote, a grossly immoral woman whose immorality <laughs> is accepted in stride. <laughs> wow, they were, they were slut-shaming in 1946, apparently. The Hayes Code, they were nothing but a party over there. <laughs> mm. I, I can imagine that ballroom is a bunch of old, stuffy white dudes. Oh, totally, totally. A um, mm-hmm. few other things. Um, after the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs, um, David O. Selznick, who did have a financial stake in the movie, and so a little bit of input still, was fighting to get this movie rushed before cameras because he wanted to capitalize on the atomic bomb droppings. He thought that the first movie that would come out that would feature this plot element would be a smash hit. And so he actually wanted to kick Cary Grant to the curb because Grant wasn't available quite yet and wanted to bring in Joseph Cotton, who'd worked with um, Hitchcock in the past, to shoot the movie very quickly, which is perhaps the most (laughs) shamelessly opportunistic thing I've ever heard from a studio (laughs) mogul, which is saying something. It doesn't surprise me in the slightest, but it's a horrible sentiment, isn't it? It really is. It's something that hasn't aged well. (laughs) Oh, okay. A little bit of trivia, though. Joseph Cotton did later play the Grant role in a radio adaptation, so he got to do it eventually. the other casting choices that are a little interesting, Vivian Leigh was um, considered for the role of um, Alicia in the film, but they ended up going with Bergman. But this was her final film under her contract with Selznick. So she would depart after that. But um, she'd worked also in Spellbound with Hitchcock. She had a history with him. And so like when they were selling this film to RKO, it was considered a Cary Grant, um, uh, Ingrid Bergman film. It, believe me, had a lot of just, there was a lot of excitement surrounding it, just selling it to RKO. They very much wanted. Um, as for the Claude Rains character, they looked at a few other actors like Clifton Webb, George Sanders, and opera star Ezio Pinza. Um, but they ultimately went with Claude Rains, who, very hardworking character actor for many years. He was the original Invisible Man. Uh, he was in one of the early Phantom of the Operas. I love Claude Rains. He's amazing. And the other casting choice, Ethel Barrymore, who they looked at to play his mother, um, the the mother of um, Alexander Sebastian in, in the movie. But they ended up going, of course, with Leopoldine, Constantine, or Constantine, perhaps, either way, um, who I think they made a smart choice there. Hitchcock and his mothers. <laughs> yes, oh, I've got I look stuff, I've got to, stuff to say about mothers, yeah. <laughs> I mean, wh- why do you think I brought my mother-in-law? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's just like quietly smoking, eyeing you down the whole time. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just embroidering something here as well. You know, quite. That was, that was how we first met. She was it just was judging it. me from the corner. <laughs> now this movie is released into theaters in 1946, and I found a fact on that year that I did not know. Did you know that was the all-time biggest movie year ever? Ever is never been topped. This is right after World War II, so you have all these soldiers coming back. They have there's a lot of in, uh, employment in the U.S., and so they have disposable income. Listen to this stat: more than 80 million people, or 57 percent of the American population, went to the theater every week. That, that I mean, that sounds like a great stat, and yeah, that's 50 percent of the population. But then, are you saying the numbers from this year beat like Endgame year? Oh. Hell yes. Like nowadays we get, I think it's something like 11% go weekly, something like that. It's maybe even less. Good grief. Well, that's, I mean, that's great. It's a shame that we've sort of lost that now, but uh, I just didn't think they had that many cinemas in those days. And that's every week. That's Mm. not, um, you know, Endgame is one weekend. Mm. This is every single week people were going pretty much through 1946. Sorry, I have no wit at your comeback. It's just such a really cool stat. I just, you know, I understand yeah. though. People are just happy to be home. It makes you think maybe what that's what this next year is going to be like post coronavirus. I don't know if it'll get that high, but yeah, it's a pretty exciting stat. And even in starting in 1947, it started dropping and it just went on a downwards trajectory to nowadays because 1947, all those soldiers who'd come back, they got married, they had kids, income was being spent on housing and, you know, children. So movies dropped back down. And they said by like, the stat I read was actually in comparison to 1993, which is the year of Jurassic Park. And mm-hmm. it was like 16, I think it was 16% of the American population went to the movies every week. 
So that's quite considerable from 57 to 16 over those 50 years. I wonder how affordable it was in those days. I think it would be quite affordable. I mean, it was not like nowadays where movies are like $20 a ticket or something. Have, you, have any of us ever gone once a week for a year? I no. have pretty much, yeah. Okay. No, but we have a TV. That's, well, that is very true, actually, yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. T- TVs roll out soon after, and that yeah. definitely takes a dent out of it. I, I think I probably went to the pictures more when I was a teenager. Um, but I, I don't know if we went once a week. But we would go, uh, you know, because, I mean, if you had a boyfriend or whatever, it was it was something you could do. I mean, you know, I grew up in a small town. There wasn't anything else to do. I mean, yeah. for, for reference, your teenage years weren't in the 40s. No, thank you for that. No, they were in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that needed a clarifying. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was 10 years ago. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this movie was unsurprisingly a hit, given its star power and director behind it. The budget for the movie was $1 million. US, they made 4.8 in their initial run. And international two point three for a total of seven point one five million dollars. That's a pretty good return on your investment. Does that mean that every film that came out this year was like pretty much a hit, guaranteed? Oh uh, yeah, it was a lot of hits. There's very you got to go quite a ways down the top like fifty before you're looking at movies that maybe weren't that much of a hit. Hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. Anything else for us, Cal? Yeah, the top three for that year. Number one was The Best Years of Our Lives, which swept the Oscars. That's actually one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, Number two, Duel in the Sun, David O. Selznick's um, somewhat uh, troubled production, wound up at number two, big hit. And number three was The Jolson Story, which was a musical. Notorious landed at number eight between The Razor's Edge, which was another Best Picture nominee, and Till the Clouds Roll By, which was a Robert Walker vehicle. Um, Also notable on the list at number 17, was the Cary Grant film Night and Day, which was a Cole Porter biopic. Mm. And a little further down the list at number 60 uh, around there, because it gets a little ha- uh, hazy when you're looking at numbers when you go down the list. But um, around number 60 was Angel on My Shoulder, which was a Claude Rains vehicle, as was Deception around spot number 70, also with Mr. Rains. And just lastly, this movie scored two Oscar nominations, one for Claude Rains for Best Supporting Actor and one for Best Original Screenplay. So there you go. That makes sense about Claude Rains. It was interesting earlier you said that they sort of sold the package of like Cary Grant, Ingrid Bergman, Alfred Hitchcock. But I mean, wasn't Claude Rains a big name by that point? He's a very well recognized name. People know who he is, but it's kind of like saying, I don't know, Steve Buscemi. We all love Steve Buscemi, but a studio wouldn't necessarily sell a movie because of Steve Buscemi. You know what I mean? Is it Buscemi or Buscemi? Uh, I always say Buscemi, but whatever you prefer. (laughs) Steve, let us know. Yeah, let us know, Steve. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Because uh, he was the—I mean, I know Ingrid Bergman and Cary Grant, but uh, hearing RKO and uh, Claude Rains in the same film gave me uh, Rocky Horror flashbacks. Oh, sure, yeah, a bit of a deep cut there. All right, let's get into it. Kay hadn't seen it. You're our guest. What did you think? I—I uh, I watched it twice this week. Um. The second time I watched it, I got a lot more out of it. Um, I wasn't sure what to ex- expect. On paper, it doesn't. It sounds okay, I, I guess. But actually, I um, I enjoyed it um, quite a lot. Actually, um, I, uh, there were lots of things. I, I don't know. I don't want to say too too much now because I guess we're going to kind of talk about different things. But um, uh, I liked. Th- the character of Alicia, I thought she, um, sometimes the, the heroines are, uh, don't have to, as much subtlety, but I think she's a great actress. I think she, she brought quite a lot to the role. I, I'm really interested in female roles in, in, in these films and how they're kind of portrayed. So I, I found that really interesting. I, I found her more interesting than Cary Grant. Um, I was a bit... <laughs> See, look at looking at it now. You think, well, how come both those guys? Uh, uh, why aren't either of them married? And why does that man still live with his mother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good question. Uh, I've got written down too. Okay. Uh, so, um, and yeah, there were. A few, uh, I, I wrote down quite a few things that, um, uh, as I 
um, as I watched it. But um, as a as a story, I thought it, it worked. I thought it was quite a, you know a decent uh, story. I thought it was really there were some really interesting uh, ways the film was told. Um, I think it, it shows sort of the attitudes of, of the time are quite sort of, uh, a little bit different now. So um, that's always. Uh, that's quite interesting that the particular time that it came out, um, I, think, I think it reflected its the times well. Um, well, I, 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 it's just interesting that you um, didn't like it the first time round. That's what, of what you said there. That's what jumped out at me because I, I won't get on mine yet. But like, so you didn't mind it then? You said on the first I, time round. I watched it and I just thought, oh, oh, uh, um, it was okay. And I thought, well, I don't know if I'm going to have find much to say about it on just. Just first kind of, I just watched it without a pen and, and just kind of watched it as though I was watching a film. But actually when I when I watched it again, uh, a few days later, I'd had a chance to think about it. And um, I, when I watched it again, I was able to kind of look for things that had, um, had struck me later. Or I saw a bit more, um, a bit more in it, I think, if that makes sense. No, I get that completely. Um... Cam, I'll throw it to you. So this is one that I've watched many times over the years. And the richness of this movie just continues to wow me. Like I sat down last night, watched my, I have bought the Criterion. Or actually I got it for Christmas, I should say. I should thank my parents for this, actually. Um, But I I sat and watched the Criterion Blu-ray, which is beautiful. And this is just a movie where I love this film because the story of it is so simple. It's so basic. You know, Scott, you summed it up there in your letterbox synopsis. But there's so much going on under the surface of this movie where we have this villain, you know, um, um, Sebastian, who we should want to see this guy just get his just served. Right. Like this guy is just a scuzz bucket. He's a Nazi working in Rio. Why would we not want to see this guy fail and get just taken down by justice? But the movie's so complicated, has a very dark view, I think, of humanity in a lot of ways, and men in particular through the Cary Grant character who comes in as this American agent where this movie is all about fragile male egos and there's a lot of darkness going on. You can definitely feel that sort of lingering. Um, oh boy, that lingering sort of cynicism or at least um, wounds coming from world war II being brought into this movie. I don't think there's a darker Cary Grant performance ever. And I think it all just kind of feeds into this movie that has a lot going on under the surface. I don't think it is a basic, you know, happily ever after type film. I think it's actually one of Hitchcock's richest films, but it's one that's told so elegantly and so with so much sophistication that it's really easy just on the first go around to just take it in as a really engrossing spy story. But I think there's more to talk about as we go forward. So I'm really curious, Scott, where you come down. I actually echo basically what Kay said. Mm -hmm. The first time I watched it, I, I had made my mind up on where it sits on the knock list which I'm not going to I'm not going to shadow eventually what I came to but at that point I wasn't a fan of the film. I right. I I didn't like Cary Grant's character. No, I didn't. Um yeah, I couldn't couldn't root for him and I I I almost rooted for Claude Rains more than Cary Grant. Uh, which maybe is by design. Um and I found Ingrid to be like is she supposed to be like our our character on the screen. We're meant to feel for what Ingrid Bergman's going through in the film. And I felt like she was a victim of her own choices at times. Um, I couldn't get on board with her either. And I, but I, did, I don't think I was really looking at it as the right sort of film. I think I was just looking at it as a spy film. Right. But on the second viewing, and I, I again, same as Kay, I took a couple of days out. I did a bit of reading, some reflection. I came back to it and I realized it's actually more of a romance story with like a spy undertone. Mm-hmm. And from that point of view, I really liked it. Yeah, like what I, it is a romance, but it's a very dark one. Hmm. And it does feel somewhat colored. I know they said that Hitchcock, um, Spellbound was the movie he'd made before this, but he'd also made a documentary on the concentration camps um, called Memory of the Camps that um, was obviously a very um, psychologically troubling project for him to work on. And I think a lot of the sort of the, the anger and just the darkness of the soul feeds into this movie where, I mean, it is a a romance film, but it is a very dark romance. And I think there's a lot of cruelty here, 
a lot of it is about these people who are wind up in this very unlikely situation where, you know, basically Cary Grant has fallen in love with Ingrid Bergman, but he will not admit it. And he's putting her into a mission that is very dehumanizing. And it's almost like he himself is putting up this defense mechanism to tarnish her throughout the movie because he can't deal with his own ego and feelings about it. But it all kind of feeds into this movie that has a real air of cruelty about it. And I kind of admire that. It it feels very risky for a movie made in those days. Well, it's, it's interesting that the most um, approachable and potentially normal character is the Nazi. Yeah. I mean, credit to you know the, the writers and, and Alfred Hitchcock, but I, f- I understood Claude Rains' position. I just felt that Ingrid and Carrie were just being mean for the, for the sake of it. I mean, at the beginning of the film, you've got her trying to run him off the road, basically. Like, well, what a, what, a, what a start. Oh, and by the way, I mean, don't, don't drink and drive, kids. <laughs> yeah, uh, Cary Grant, um, often in uh, drunk driving situations uh, in yeah. Hitchcock movies. <laughs> yeah, the Cary Grant special. I See, I, I thought of that as actually, um, you know, she's driving really recklessly. She's kind of, a, a, um, she's a little bit out of control. And I think that happens quite a lot through this film is that actually she's, um, kind of power and control is is taken away from her, and she is on this kind of um, almost inevitable out of control path. Um, you know that's that that's the kind of the danger that she's in. I yeah, I just didn't get why she initially. I, I I now look back and understand it, but I don't know why she took the mission to begin with. Oh, I think it, it through guilt because of her father being yeah yeah absolutely being, her father being and, convicted as a nazi spy and she's she's basically told to she's got to make up for her father's crime she's got to atone for his crimes even though she didn't agree with him or, or ish and hated him mm. she's kind of you know yeah feels this kind of uh guilt and because actually um she she's kind of bullied into doing this somehow but and she doesn't actually have anything to gain from it, from from the position that she's in. She, what what does what does she gain from doing it? Apart from like the whole, you know, claiming back your identity, your name, that sort of thing, for king and country. Or well, it wasn't a king at that point. It was well, state. I mean, it's. But, but I I didn't buy it when I first watched it. I I had the same question. Why Why would you do it? Yeah, I don't. She's not doing it for like, necessarily because she. You know, she wants to be patriotic or whatever. I think she's kind of, um, you know, browbeaten it into it, really. Um, and uh, and because she, Cary Grant sort of rejects her, but she doesn't. She doesn't love um, S- Sebastian. You know, she's. Um, I just feel like she's. Um, she's quite. She comes. She's quite a fragile character. And I think she's um, she's out of she's kind of lost control. Yeah, I, I'd agree, and I think it's very telling that scene where we first are introduced to Cary Grant, where he's just sitting. We don't even see his face; it's no. just the camera behind him, as she's you know kind of staggering around this party. And this is a woman who's obviously having just real issues with her, maybe her conscience, but this issue with her father being convicted, I think, is really weighing on her, and it's making her self destructive. And it's almost like she's playing right into Cary Grant's hands, the way that what they're looking for in this agent, this this woman who they can keep saying, oh, you're just a train wreck. Oh, you're just, you know, you're just like, um, you know, he constantly goes at her about drinking, for example, or just her behavior being chaotic or what have you. It's almost like mani- uh, manipulating her into this mission because, hey, whatever, you're just a mess. You won't be able to figure yourself out. You can serve your state and make yourself a better person this way, even though the mission is more cruel than anything towards her yeah absolutely and um i mean the notorious in the title is she she's instantly seen as this notorious figure because of what her father's done um she's clearly um educated she's wealthy um she, she doesn't have a job does she she doesn't have to work she's lives in quite a privileged world but she doesn't have any real it seems like she doesn't have any real friends. She doesn't have any family. She doesn't have a mother to, to guide yeah. her. You know, she's kind of um, a little bit adrift. And um, 
I feel that you know they take a, that take advantage of that, and that's maybe she's clinging to a father figure type. I don't know. Don't necessarily have to go down that road, but um, well, yeah, you know, there there, there seems kind of that um, that aspect to her, and she's she's notorious. Uh, because she's um she's it suggests that she's uh she she drinks and she's a bit promiscuous hey you know that's uh and she's really judged for that and i think it's very telling that they want to use this woman to seduce her father's friend like they are definitely playing on the father issues that could be at play here and uh, it, it feels like a very cynical move on the part of Cary Grant's character. But in particular, I mean, he, Cary Grant doesn't quite know the mission. It's the um, character of uh, Prescott, played by Louis Cowherrn, who is the overseer of this mission. That's the one who has, I think, he's the one who comes out looking wor- the worst possibly. Like, he's the guy who's more than willing to just throw this woman away. Cary Grant at least can say, I didn't know exactly what the mission was. Which it's that sort of uh, classic spy movie trope of you know the, the 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 old white men sitting in rooms deciding people's fate. Yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I the, my first bump in the film came when she chose to take the mission. The second bump came not long afterwards when they got to Rio, and she almost after a scene of them drinking at a cafe, they were madly in love with each other. Well, that's also a thing of the times. Uh, I mean, it is Cary Grant. Uh, I love him. But uh, no one else does in this podcast, apparently. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I, um, I don't love this Cary Grant. This Cary Grant's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Intentionally. <laughs> yeah, I'll take the bumbling uh, Roger Thornhill over, the, over Devlin any day. I mean, back in these days, love affairs happened in movies in about five minutes. So you kind of just got to go with it, that the emotions of the moment have caught them up and this love affair has happened. It, you know, it is what it is. So when are you sweeping me off to Rio? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a very telling scene, though. I'm glad you bring up that. On the flight over, she looks out the window at the statue in awe, and if you, it pans over and Cary Grant's staring at her. So Cary Grant, his early on said, oh, I don't trust women. Um, he will never say he's in love with her. But in that moment, we're seeing that he actually is falling for her or has fallen for her. So even though Cary Grant says actually very little in this movie, um, it, it often feels like he's you know very aloof and distant. A, a lot of what's being shown visually is showing that Cary Grant really has fallen for this woman. And, and why wouldn't you? I mean, she's she's so she's beautiful. She's she's lit so fabulously in all her close-ups she's just she just like oh i don't i don't know she's just luminous and and fragile and um and you just want to you know i fell in love with her she's so you know kind of thing she's you just want to kind of um i don't know protect her i think i felt well I think uh, Kay's going to get Ingrid. I'll take Carrie. And I think that <laughs> Cam has Claude Rains. <laughs> but it's interesting because this woman is portrayed as a train wreck character early on, right? Like that's how they're viewing her. But I would argue in some way, she's the most together of any of the characters of the primary characters, because I think Cary Grant has a lot of issues. Like the male ego stuff in this movie is insane where his character really becomes cruel and a jerk and really starts trying to take her to task for a mission they've sent her on, even though like it's his responsibility in, in so many ways, like he's a really horrible handler of this situation. And then on the flip side, you have Claude Rains, who's also just like this quivering mass over this woman, very fragile ego, constantly terrified. She's going to fall in love with someone else. Like you see that it's the men in this situation that are the ones that are crumbling, not her. They, they both feel like two parts of that uh, that sort of nice guy trope. So mm. You have like the viciousness where they like always bite back and that's Cary Grant. And then you've got that sort of actual quivering mess underneath, which is Claude Rains. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if uh, Alfred just got through a breakup or something like that. Or... Uh, I don't think Alfred had... A... He was married by this point. He was married to um, his wife Alma for most of his life. I mean... Uh... I don't know that Alfred Hitchcock had like a rich dating history to draw upon for these sorts of stories. He <laughs> wasn't a looker, was he? No. And he always <laughs> said, like, I actually saw an interview clip where they asked him about 
um, you know, when he was young in love affairs, he's like, I was a loner. And that's all he said. So there you have it. And that's when Cam became a big fan of his work. (laughs) I have a portrait of him staring down at me right now. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if you're joking, but I believe it. (laughs) No, I I don't. I don't. (laughs) It's just a mirror. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) And there's a single solitary tear coming down (laughs) one cheek. Um. Well, I, I guess we should um, get on to the individual performances, but I did want to touch on one thing before I move away from it. Kay was saying about how Ingrid was lit, and there's lots of amazing camera shots in this film, and I'm sure we'll talk about a few more of them later, but the one where um, Carrie Grant's character is playing her the record, and she emerges from the bedroom, and she's like starts off in darkness and comes out into the light. I mean, that, yes. that's pretty good for 1946. I mean, Hitchcock is one of the great visual stylists and he's working with Ingrid Bergman, who audiences have fallen in love with because of Casablanca just a few years before this. So they would have had that movie in mind, I think, while watching Notorious. And a scene like that is just that is making this actress even more iconic. Just a shot like that. Like he is designing shots as to how to make her look incredible, how to make all the characters look iconic just on their own. I just want to see more shots to the back of Cary Grant's head, please. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, you also see a shot, though, from the back of Claude Rains' head later in the film where he's embracing with her and she's trying to hide the key. Mm. And it's her looking over his shoulder and dropping the key on the ground. Um, So once again, the men are often shown in her life just from the back, kind of faceless, right? Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Well, let's, let's, let's get on to some of the people. So... Cary Grant's here as uh, apparently T.R. Devlin, according to the synopsis, but I never heard that in the film. Yeah, I just have Devlin on IMDb. Yeah, same. But I, again, every time I've seen Cary Grant, he's never let me down. Well, he's one of the great movie stars, right? I'm just curious, Kay, what, did you have any experience with Cary Grant going back? You know, unrelated <laughs> well, to Hitchcock stuff. <laughs> a, lady, a lady doesn't count. <laughs> um, I... <laughs> Uh, I've seen a lot of films uh, where he's uh, in kind of screwball comedies and things. Um, and he's all, I think he was probably older then um, because I'm pretty sure they were in colour. Um, and I think he has a lovely, uh, a ch- lovely charm and, of, you know, you feel like, oh, you're, you're safe with Cary Grant. You know, generally, um, you, you know, it's going to be a, um, a decent and uh, funny. I mean, you know, it, it, I don't remember many films where he was quite as unappealing as as this one. He's generally, I would, I would think, oh, Car- oh, that's going to be lovely. It's going to be warm and funny. Um, so, so yeah, obviously, I've, I've I've seen him in other styles of films, but he's generally. Um, more of a hero and in this one I I don't think he you know I don't think he is particularly heroic or likable I like that you brought up that when you see Cary Grant movies you can kind of rely on the fact that you're gonna like him and be drawn in by him and he's fun you know as the screwball comedies of course he'd done bringing up baby in the the 1930s like he's an amazing guy but Hitchcock liked to twist that because he made a movie called Suspicion in the early 40s where it was a woman who thought her husband might be a murderer and the murderer was played by, you know, or the p- potential murderer was played by Cary Grant. And Hitchcock liked to use Grant's image of this, this lovable, likable guy to kind of pull you into these darker stories. Because as in this movie, what I think works is the magnetism of Cary Grant is that you can understand, like, I think the love story actually makes a lot of sense. And, you know, Scott, you said it's very quick, but I think when you're putting Cary Grant in the role, audiences forgive a lot. And just the fact that you're using that image, that famous kind of concept of Cary Grant and twisting it and giving it this very dark edge, I find just fascinating. And I think Grant is very, very, very good in this role. I think the fact that he didn't get an Oscar nomination is a little damning because I think what he's doing here is a lot more challenging than some of his other work. Well, here's a question. If Cary Grant is the actor of the time that is known as like the ultimate good guy, a relatable, charming, handsome sort of bloke. What is the modern day equivalent? Um, 
I'd say George Clooney is the one who's often compared to Cary Grant from modern day. Uh, and I think George Clooney's career has gone maybe a different path in that last few, you know, handful of years, but maybe earlier on him. I don't know. What do you think? I, I, I was thinking up the question, trying to think of an answer, but I actually haven't got something. I'll come back to you later if I do. Kay, Joe, any ideas? Um, maybe Tom Hanks, but he's maybe not quite as, as a romantic hero. Well, Tom Hanks gets compared more to like a modern day Jimmy Stewart. More yeah. So. Yes, I can see that. Yeah. What about someone yeah. like Chris Evans or something like that? A slightly newer. No. no, it's, there's something about the Cary Grant touch that just very few actors have it. It's the ability to just walk on screen and be instantly charismatic and just win over everyone in the room. And I think you see that in some of the Clooney movies. Um, like maybe Out of Sight or uh, Ocean's Eleven is actually a good example as well, where it's just, it's all movie star charisma. And very few actors have that nowadays. We don't really search out movie star charisma the way they did in those days. We just watch him in the first few seasons of ER. Oh, now you're Yeah, talking. well. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. electric in that. And he he's the best thing in those first few seasons. Yeah. So that's, I remember a lot of press and a lot of print being written about Clooney earlier on in his career about him being more of a modern day Cary Grant. I think a lot of that was by design. They looked at what role this guy could fill and tried to put him on that path. But he obviously went into his doing his own thing as a director and wanting to choose movies that were more challenging, like Syriana, for example. But I think he's maybe our closest. Well, okay. We've got Ingrid Bergman up next. I, for me, she is the star of the film. Oh yeah. Easily. Yeah. It, I know uh, Cary Grant gets top billing, but I think that's more just to do with the time. Um, well, often female uh, actors were actually ranked first on uh, notices. I just think at this point, though, Cary Grant is a mega star, So he's going to get top billing no matter what. It's kind of like a Tom Cruise or something. They're going to get top billing. That makes sense. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned Matahari earlier on. Um, that She feels like, and she even mentions a sort of Matahari type. You feel like this character is is born to die, so mm -hmm. it's amazing how she narrowly escapes it in the end because basically her fate is sealed. Oh yeah, I I genuinely thought that she was going to die in the end when the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, he's going to say he loves her and then she's just going to die in his arms or something. I I I was quite um, expecting that. And like Ingrid Bergman is one of those actresses that was very good at playing women who the audience instantly loved who had a series of bad things happen to where the sympathy just got more and more deep you know i think of the movie gaslight where she's married to a guy who's um convincing her that she's mentally ill over the course of the film to the point where she's basically a recluse who's falling apart by the end and your heart just breaks watching her and i think a lot of that carries over to this movie where you sympathize so much because you understand you know she does love carrie grant and it is based like in a pure love. He th he keeps trying to convince her, oh, no, no, you just love any man. You just love any man because look what you're doing now. And we see the purity of this character, even though none of the men will acknowledge it at all. And so it wounds us that much more, the journey she goes through, where to the point where she's being just like consistently drugged by Claude Rains and everything on a bed. You're just like, oh, my God, this poor woman, get her out of here. <laughs> yeah, because there's that moment in the film where it could have gone a different way. I think that you know when they they're having they have a uh, they're going to have dinner on the balcony. She's going to try and cook a chicken. Go out, go. I've got to go and you know I've got to go out. I'll bring back a bottle of wine. And then in the space of ha however long it takes him to to come back, and then the whole sort of trajectory changes. I mean, she was, uh, you know, she was. We have these conversations where she says she's, you know, can't. Don't you believe a woman can change? You know, uh, um, I, you know. And she seems uh, like she wants to embrace this kind of uh, domestic role, and let's and we, we're in love, and we can, you know, we can do the whole marriage and happily ever after. And then, you know, for, he comes back, and it's and it with the mission, and he completely like shuts down emotionally on her, and and then, you know, and then she's she's that's kind of a turning point, and then she's on this other path where it's all going to go out of control for her. So you feel like, oh, she wants to change. She wants to be the good little wife or whatever. Um, 
but she she can't she can't she's she's locked into this um once a tramp always a tramp kind of um persona that they're they're pushing her into and props to alicia as well and that she gives back somewhat too towards carrie grant because there's like the moment where she says to him like well i've added him to my play things or what playmates or whatever mm. the word she uses and that is entirely done to get back at like because carrie grant keeps snarking back at her with these mm. put downs Absolutely. and she does it right to him and she targets his ego like she has more power than i think um maybe even she realizes like she has a huge impact on Cary Grant throughout this movie. And she's the one cracking away at him throughout. Uh, Cam and I recently guested on an episode of the your next favorite movie podcast, which may or may not be out by this point, but we were speaking about the twin peaks film fire walk with me. And you just think about the character of Laura Palmer and how you want to go in there and save her. I think Ingrid Bergman does exactly the same thing with this film. And that's credit to her because you, you could just watch her destruction and you want to try and save her and you, you want Cary Grant to turn up at the end and whisk her away. Yeah, yeah, you totally do. And I love the visual motif of this movie of staircases where the danger is her constantly going up the stairs, whether dragged up or walking up on her own volition. Um, and the freedom is her walking down the stairs, descending them. And on the flip side, Claude Rains, his demise is both going down the stairs and then having to go back up to face the, his co you know, colleagues who are probably going to kill him. Absolutely. He, he, he gets killed 10 minutes after that. Oh yeah. Hit him and he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Which uh, brings us quite nicely onto Claude Rains. Claude Rains is amazing guys. <laughs> he, he, is, uh, he is. He's fantastic in this. He's the, he's the most approachable person in this film. I, I could see myself as Claude Rains, except the Nazi bit. Sure, sure. Um, and there's a little detail, too, in that, like, the group he works for, um, they mentioned he worked for IG Farben, which IG Farben was like a pharmaceutical and chemical company that actually uh, manufactured through their subsidiaries the gas that was used in the concentration camps. So it's interesting that they're working in details like that for this character that are incredibly dark. And they actually edited that out in earlier versions of the movie. And it wasn't until a little bit later they put it back in. But this is a guy who is in every way unsympathetic. He she is just a nightmare of a human being. He's working on an atomic bo uh, bomb with fellow Nazis. This is just a horrible guy. But why do we sympathize with him? I think it's all Claude Rains' face. There's so much just... I mean, they found humanity in this character. He is wounded by the, you know, the fact he was in love with this woman. She was not interested. She comes back into his life. And he can't believe, he can't convince himself that she might love him. Like, this is a broken man, but it's all carried on Claude Rains' face. And it's so compelling to watch. It's a, it's a genuine human reaction. He put himself out there and he was betrayed. We can all understand that. Yeah. And what I love, too, is when he realizes he's betrayed. He's not a stupid character, which I also appreciated. Which, you know, he realizes that the key's gone missing. He knows what's happened. He goes down, investigates, finds the um, the powder on the ground and the piece of the glass. And what does he do? He just, like, goes up and, like, wanders into his mom's room and sits in a chair and just needs to talk to her to try to make everything right. Like, this is a guy with a lot of issues. And it's just always fascinating to watch them play out on screen. I think he's one of the richest villains in Hitchcock movies. If you even can look at him as a villain in the same way you would some of the others. Yeah. And I think that that distorted kind of close up of his face when he admits that uh, yeah, I was married to a, an American, American agent. And there's that sort of really strange angle and this sort of, um, uh, it, it really shows his, his agony of, of that he's been betrayed and and also i think he knows that actually we're gonna have to kill her you know he he knows that and and there's that sort of really weird uh kind of close-up from a from a from above i think it is and um he looks really he looks like a gargoyle or something in this kind of like spasm of of pain on his face it's interesting Kay, you mentioned that moment because it's the it's the exact same thing that Cary Grant's character has to go through when he finds out about the mission. At one point, both these guys have to put their love to one side and deal with their job. 
And that unfortunately means bad things for Ingrid Bergman. Yeah. And I like that, you know, you have that scene where they're on the horses. Horse hearts coming back. Yeah. <laughs> 2021. <laughs> but um, Cary Grant sends her off on the horse to be rescued by Claude Rains. And then that scene cuts to just Cary Grant smoking alone at a cafe. And it's a very quick shot, especially for the old days where they would tend to linger more on shots. It's it's fairly quick. And then we have that scene where Claude Rains goes into his mother's room, confesses everything. And what is the what happens? The mother starts smoking. There's like this movie constantly uses cigarettes as sort of the key that characters are experiencing a very dark moment. And alcohol. Yeah, alcohol too, yeah, for sure. Mm. Um, I mean, apart from that. The only other character that really jumps off of the page is um, Claude Rains' mother, played by Leopoldine Constantine, Constantine, as Cam said. Yeah. She's the only other one I think is worth mentioning, unfortunately, but there is a much larger cast. Well, it really is like a three-hander here. We've got our main core three characters, and everyone else is peripheral to that. It's all about this this triangle between these three. That's what the movie's about, so everyone else kind of supports. But the mother character is great. <laughs> Isn't she's she? not as um <gasps> she's so amazing she's not as say cartoonish as some of the other mother figures like say north by northwest the more comedic mother figure that carrie grant had there or even the one in uh strangers on a train but this woman is just cold and calculating and she despite not being in these meeting rooms with the you know the the nazi agent guys she's the one in control at least as far as the claude reigns character is going she's She's clearly like cold hearted bitch, but she's she does everything to protect her son, like every mother would. Um, but I, I did notice that at the end, um, he's quite happy to um, escape and save his own skin and leave his mother behind. Right. I mean, I, I was stunned by that scene. I'd forgotten <laughs> about that. It's funny. Like every time I watch this movie, I find something new. Yeah. But I'd forgotten that he was more than willing to just jump in that cab absolutely, and leave yeah. his mom behind to be killed. Yeah, absolutely. Bloody ungrateful kids. <laughs> I suppose that brings uh, that brings everyone's estimations down on the Alexander Sebastian character, I suppose. Well, I don't know. Here's the question, because in this moment, both the men are willing to sacrifice someone else because you have Sebastian's going to hightail it out of there and leave his mom to be killed. But the way that Cary Grant just says like, nope, sorry, see you later, and drives mm. away. That's very cold, too. Both these men have very cold moments in the final seconds of this movie. The things we do for love. <laughs> I just looked at my, my notes and what I'd written down there was that actually I did. There was one point in the film where I, where I did actually laugh. Um, and it was the, um, the one of the, the, the kind of nasty German henchmen, the one who bumped off the uh, Emil. Um, mm. when he's talking about, um, you know, uh, driving home and, um, and, you know, jump out of the car and let him, let him sort of go to his death. And he said, he just sort of casually says, oh, um, you have to be really careful because I turned my ankle last time. And I just, it's just a throwaway line, but I just, I laughed so much. I just thought I wasn't expecting the, the Nazis to be funny. I didn't and, even catch that line. So it just it, yeah, it just I had done my ankle last time. He says oh, he says, Oh yeah, something about um yeah, I turned my ankle last time, so I I better be careful. And it was just such a kind of a terrible thing to say, but it was I thought it was hilarious. So I that was the that was the I wrote that down because I, I wasn't expecting wasn't expecting that. I don't know if it was meant to be funny. It, I mean he certainly, you know, he, he delivered it with a straight face. Well, I don't know. Hitchcock had a very dark sense of humor. Yeah, I, think, I can totally see I think it. so. I think so. So he's um... getting too old for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. Well, I think that's all the the main characters there. Um, before we get to the knock list, I think it's worth going through any last thoughts. Yeah, I want to talk about the whole key sequence, everything dealing with that. Mm -hmm. um, there's some amazing filmmaking going on here with the suspense of her stealing the key and them at the party. Um, trying to get into the wine cellar as we're watching the number of bottles go down. This also features one of Hitchcock's greatest shots, which is the balcony shot looking down at the party as the camera zooms into the key in her hand. Mm -hmm. There's amazing filmmaking going on here. All timer stuff from Hitchcock. But what did you guys think of the, of that, you know, that whole key 
a plot element. I felt like the film was missing that tension until that point. Because then mm. you have that ticking clock of the alcohol being consumed. Which is another Hitchcock thing, of having a ticking clock playing out. And that was quite cool to see. But yeah, you're, that shot coming from the balcony down into her hand. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that now, let alone then. Right? Yeah, like I don't... It's terrific. I feel like if they did it nowadays, there would be a lot of digital trickery going on as well. Mm. Yeah, because this is all you know, film yeah. with massive, massive cameras, right? Yep. Uh, what did you think about the uh, the whole key gimmick, Kay? Um, yeah, I absolutely agree. I thought it was, um, it, I thought it, she showed a lot of um, ingenuity. You're thinking, oh my God, how is she going to, you know, she's not trained in in espionage or whatever she's, you know, and uh, I thought it was really clever. She just drops the key and, and uh you know, she, she's clearly resourceful and can think on her feet. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought I thought it was. Uh, I I like the whole suspense thing. Um, you know, you you uh, you did feel kind of, you know, on the edge of your seat. She, you know, they're in danger and what's going to happen. And um, yeah, I I also um, looking at that the view down onto that from the balcony onto the onto that um lobby or what i don't know what we're calling that uh there that room there um with that kind of checkerboard um the tiles it just reminded me of um like a chess game and the piece there the piece you know she's been moved around that you know you could just see them uh in this kind of strategic kind of movements around the around the floor it just reminded me of a chessboard right it's, it's interesting as well to think that she is so adept in the moment if mm. we're talking more about the spy plot now um she's just a civilian she has no training it's like the whole north by northwest thing again where they, there's this guy who stumbles into a plot um you know she figures a lot of stuff out by herself she sussed out she's being poisoned just because someone forgets to grab the wrong drink yep she's, she's quite intuitive and she also clues in when the character Emil is pointing at the bottle. She's the one that's like, wait a second, something's up with these bottles and I don't know why. A lot of the a lot of the fact finding is her. I actually think if we're going to talk about spies, I actually think Alicia is a pretty good agent. I would agree because I, on my first viewing, and this is probably one of the reasons why I travel with the film, I didn't understand the whole bottle thing. Okay, yeah. I don't. Maybe I didn't catch her glance at it, but I just remember the scene of them sort of telling uh, is it a meal mm-hmm. off and being like why what did he do and then they, and then they kill him i just said uh, what why is he dead and i never got it and it was only the second viewing that i sort of caught that glance and obviously had seen what happened to the bottles in the, at the late bit of the film so uh, i'm not a very good spy apparently i do think notorious is a movie that benefits from rewatches i think you guys would probably agree right absolutely yeah if, if i'd just done the one and got on this uh, episode it, it, it would have been a, a more of a dire affair well you know when we talk about hitchcock movies we're often talking about well on this podcast in particular uh, we talked about north by northwest and 39 steps those movies are much flashier than notorious but i think this movie has a lot of more interesting things going on under the surface like those movies are blockbuster entertainments this one is a character drama a much deeper spy film that I think you have to actually analyze and break down much more so. It's far more cerebral than the, the those two films, which are basically man on the run. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is actually quite interesting that Kay came on because she doesn't like the, uh, the sort of more action-y films. I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't hate them, but I don't, um, I find them a little, a bit boring sometimes when I'm just like, Oh, just get get on with the actual acting and stop punching each other or or you know crashing into stuff. Find that really let's say lazy. And I think I, I'm but I'm clearly not the audience for that as I'm not a fifteen year old boy. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> and yes, I am. Cut, and you've <laughs> cut me off. <laughs> the only interesting thing I had left to sort of uh, talk about is. Did they not know how to kiss in 1946? Ah, okay. I, there's an answer. I'm glad for that. you brought that up. Yeah, there is. Well, okay, so maybe talk about your observations of the kisses in this movie, Scott. Like, what 
what jumped out to you? Well, there was a scene, um, the one on the balcony, which is quite a sort of protracted scene of them kissing, talking about dinner. He takes a phone call whilst they're still kissing. But they're not actually kissing. They're just kind of touching each other's face with their lips, which I suppose is kissing. But I don't know. It didn't feel like kissing, and it felt a bit weird. Like, they, they were missing each other's mouths all the time. And maybe mm-hmm. maybe I'm doing it wrong, Cam. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Kay, Kay, what do you have to comment on this? Well, I also wrote down what is with the weird kissing. So I, I did look that up. Uh, and it's because of the um, production codes. Uh, they're only allowed a three second kiss. Um, so they that's why they cut it up into that sort of weird uh, stop and go kind of thing to get around the three second rule. Yeah. And also this movie was marketed as having like, I think the longest kiss in history. Um, at that time in movies because of the fact it's a prolonged scene and Hitchcock shoots it all I think in one take almost doesn't he but um, I'd have to go back and check the tape on that one but um, the fact that it's these characters constantly entwined they keep kissing and so it's this protracted scene of them kissing but they can't hold the kiss longer than three seconds so it makes this romantic scene feel a lot longer than maybe the what is actually visually happening on screen but Back in the day, this would have been quite saucy, Scott. Oh, I felt the sauce. It's just not the kind of sauce I'd like. Um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't eat that entree. But Scott, Scott was like, I wouldn't blow my forbidden candle for this. <laughs> I don't think I hear that joke again. Good old Matt Harry. Um, but no, I just wrote down like, yeah, do they, do they know how to kiss? Is that how they kissed in the 40s? <laughs> Because I, I'm not gonna. Okay, I'm not gonna ask you. I'm not, I'm not doing that joke. I don't um, know. No, no, no. But like, I don't know. Because people talk about like French kissing, and I just thought maybe is that is this like a style of kissing? And that, that's what I looked into, and it obviously wasn't. And then you're telling me it's the Hayes codes, which makes way more sense than what I looked up. Um, I just ended up with people kissing in like '40s videos, which is the most bizarre thing to watch. But uh, yeah. The censorship code was very strong at this point. And so, you know, the, the actors had to remain completely standing up the whole time. There could be nothing where it's going to imply they're going to be laying down. Um, you may notice this is a movie about a woman who has to prostitute herself to another man. And there is really no allusions to sex whatsoever throughout the film. We just have to take it on faith it's happening, right? Yeah, you just, you're just assuming that they've slept together. And uh, yeah, was that the hint at the racetrack? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's what she was playing. Yeah, that's what I took yeah. from it because of like Playboy playmates and stuff like that. But okay, well, uh, well done in that sense, they got the message across without saying the word. Yeah, and I mean, the Hayes Code, as I said, was really cracking down on this project initially before they started shooting, so uh, they would have had to work around it. And that's what I kind of love about old movies is the way they dance around the censors. And when you look at the actual what this movie is about and what it's selling to an audience to get that through on basically a G rating or a PG rating or whatever you want to call it in those days. um, That is pretty impressive. Okay. Well, I think that wraps me up for any additional thoughts. Kay, what have you got for us? Um, I was interested in um, uh, how they, how they told the story and how they use the different locations. And I'm quite interested in, um, kind of male and female spaces and um, and how they use that. And traditionally, um, female spaces is, is in, in the house, in the kind of domestic uh, setting. And uh, when they're quite early on in the beginning at her party, she's, she's um, Alicia says she's stifled by being in, indoors and that's why she wants to go out for a drive. And um, so they're, they're driving quite fast and it's quite a... Um, you know that's generally associated probably with with sort of male protagonists and the sort of um you know that kind of action action sort of thing and uh i just thought a lot of their important meetings take place outside so uh in the cafe that they're, they're outside that they first kisses out on the on the mountain um they do their weird kissing on the balcony and they also have their argument on the balcony and and they're out riding and so a lot of their their sort of key scenes are, are outside. So she's and she, um, 
she sort of quite says quite clearly, you know, can you get me a maid? I can't, I don't cook, you know, um, you know, she's, she's, um, she's not domestic. And that also marks her out as, um, you know, she's, she's not the um, ideal, you know, American homemaker, ladylike wife that the um, Preston and his cronies have their wives back home that, you know, they're virtuous kind of mm. really church mm, going, yeah. you know, virgins or whatever. And but they're um, there's nothing wrong with her basically. So, well, yeah, she's, she, she's got the, you know, she's shown as she, she's not the domestic sort of, you know, angel of the house kind of uh, thing. But when she, she does marry uh, Sebastian, most, a lot of their scenes are, are indoors. She, she's now, she's occupying the domestic space, but it, it, it nearly kills her. Uh, and also, she's not the alpha female in the home she's she's not the one making the decisions you know the mother sends all the you know closes the house down when they they're due back from their honeymoon she you know the mother has the keys to the to the closets and and that sort of thing so she's not even queen in her own domestic space and it's it's eventually it's been in the house she she's she's um she's trapped in the home when they're trying to poison her, she can't. She can't escape. So it becomes her kind of prison, um, and at the end, she has to be broken out of there, back in, back sort of outside. So um, I just thought that was sort of interesting, and also the the thing with all the locked doors just reminded me of um, kind of the Bluebeard uh, story, where you know, opening locked doors is is always trouble. <laughs> you know, you uh, <laughs> so that's kind of. Um, you know, quite a traditional sort of uh, trope, isn't it? That, you know, uh, nosing around, un unlocking doors is you're asking for trouble. Um, so that was just something that I I found quite interesting from my feminist soapbox. I'd never really, yeah, thought about that. But yeah, you're right. Like when she's indoors, that's where the problems really happen. Because even with the way she's... Um you know, set up, it's indoors when her father is convicted. She's indoors when she's drunk at the party and Cary Grant yeah. is basically, you know, re going to recruit her for this um, for this assignment. It's not until she's actually getting outdoors that safety happens, really. Yeah, absolutely. So, she, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. I, d I, I don't know if it's deliberate, but... It, um... well, that was, that was going to be my question, was uh, it almost feels like uh, a bird in a cage kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, letting her free is, is what's good for her. Uh, maybe that's what they were leaning towards. And, and I didn't pick up on any of this. It feels like it must be a conscious effort, though. Oh, I mean, you know, you go back and watch Hitchcock movies. There's so much intention behind them that it's it's kind of astonishing, really, how rich they are, because you can just spot the tropes throughout his movies that he continues. But just like individual works have so much depth to them that they just... I mean, there's a reason that people continue to rewatch his movies nowadays, even still. Like, they have so much more sophistication than I think people often acknowledge in older movies. His stuff's working at levels we dream of even nowadays. Well, I think that sums everyone up. Cam, any last thoughts? Um, just wanted to say I really dig the shot, too, where she's waking up from being um, drunk. And we get yeah. the shot of Cary Grant as the camera spins around. Basically, the hangover shot, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that was a, a fantastic shot in a movie with many great shots. I mean, I don't think it could take the place of the staircase shot down to the key, but that that was something I wrote down very early in my notes, that sort of dizzying spin shot on Cary Grant. I, I mean, I almost feel like that must have been harder to pull off than the other one. It wouldn't have been easy, no. right, in those days? It's not the sort of camera you could just spin around. You have to build, like, a whole thing for it, I would have thought. Yeah, um... I'm not exactly sure how they would have done that. Um, I'll have to dig into that one a little further, just out of curiosity. But, but yeah, yeah. Suffice to say, the cinematography in this film is tremendous. It's probably one of the best looking of his films I've seen. I, I prefer this to Thirty Nine Steps. What about North by Northwest? I don't think you can beat the dust cropper stuff. Yeah, I I agree. And we should say the cinematography was by Ted Tetzlaff. So let's just get his name out there because he was obviously a virtuoso on this film. I do have one final thing I'll say. The one thing that I feel like is never quite clicked in this movie is the score by Roy Webb. I think a lot of Hitchcock movies, we acknowledge them for their scores. You know, when we think about North by Northwest or Psycho, Vertigo. Um, I don't know that this one is quite up to snuff with some of the others, but it's fine. 
I didn't notice it, which it probably backs up your point. Yeah, yeah. And did you, did you hear it at all, Kay? Did you make um, mention of it? No, not really. Um, I did. That's one of the things that I I read. Did read something about it, and um, the kind of the use of classical music is supposed to kind of suggest their sort of um, you know cultural kind of refinement. Um, but I didn't. I didn't recognize any of them any of the tunes so um but no i didn't really notice it either well i'm definitely not cultured so i wouldn't have recognized anything <laughs> it's a little wallpaper score as opposed to the sweeping scores or the really interesting scores we get later in hitchcock's career or even a little before well great cinematography meh soundtrack i'll take it yeah <laughs> yeah um okay so question time does notorious make the knock list k you're up um i'm gonna say yes but don't ask have i got to justify it absolutely <laughs> um no i um whether it makes your list or not um i'm gonna put it on my own list as something i would probably watch again um so um you can do what you like it's with your list well here's a question for you <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, it bloody well is our list yes exactly. would you <laughs> would you take this film over the 39 steps um yes i think i would wow so it actually worked out well then didn't it there you go <laughs> maybe we we'll plan this are you happy along. now scott are you happy yes now? yes i am <laughs> <laughs> okay cam what have we got um, it's a big slam dunk yes for me. This is, I think, one of the great Hitchcock films, but also, you know, we talk about, is it a spy film? Is it a romantic drama? I think one concept we're going to revisit again and again is sort of the concept of like the expendable agent. And this is one of the great examples of the female expendable agent story. We talked about Matahari, a movie that didn't make the list. And I felt like it was close, like it had some really good ideas, but it didn't quite do that as well. Uh, we'll have more of these coming up in the future, but I feel like this one is so incredibly well done. And just the the way of the male agents versus the female agents and the expectations and how this all comes across in this situation, it's an incredible spy story and a really great portrait of a female spy, I feel like. Okay, folks, I am uh, I am in two minds about this film. And I'll tell you for why. On my first watch, I didn't like it. I, I straight up didn't like it. It, it, it almost bored me. I, I checked my phone from time to time. I just couldn't get into it. And so I knew I had to go back and visit it again because I've done that before with these films. And I, I found enjoyment in the second viewing or I found things I've missed. And I did enjoy it more in the second viewing. And technically, to me, this is a fantastic film. And I, in terms of spectacle, in terms of acting, in terms of casting, fantastic writing brilliant it didn't give me that feeling um and that's that's what still troubles me to this day i don't think i would rewatch this film and so i'm gonna go with no okay uh, fair enough it doesn't change the vote it's making the knock list that's fine but i have to go with my gut on this one so it's, it, that's and that's where i stand Okay, that's fair enough. I mean, you let in famously the Ipcris file, so you're coming down on the other way for Notorious. <laughs> yeah, ultimately, I think this is technically a great film and probably one of Hitchcock's best films. It just didn't do anything for me. Um, right. I I enjoyed everyone in it in their own way, but I also didn't like anyone. I I I I felt bad for people, but I didn't didn't like them, and so it left me kind of cold. You can kind of see why it is much more of a critic's darling than an audience darling, in, 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 it seems nowadays. Yeah, I, I mean, you both have more... Um, you both have such a rich history in films and a, a large amount of knowledge in, in films. I understand why you both are able to see it maybe for what it truly is. And I think maybe I'm just getting stuck on my sort of popcorn-eating, average cinema-going brain. And maybe that's where my hang-up is. Well, you know what, though, as someone who watches a lot of classic films, they're not all for me. There's been classic films I've come across where I said, well, I can appreciate what it's doing in its time, but it left me cold. 
And uh, that's fair enough if Notorious left you that way versus maybe some of the other Hitchcocks that you preferred. And we're going to have some other Hitchcocks in the future that uh, maybe you'll love that other people don't like. Like Hitchcock, we've tackled so far the 39 Steps, North by Northwest, and Notorious. Those three are, they tend to have, I guess, a little more consensus to them. Um, But we're going to have some coming up that are much more polarizing. And maybe some of those will work for you. And a lot of people will tell you, like, I don't agree with that whatsoever. So it'll be interesting as we go into the future and tackle some of those. Yeah, I think so too. I I, I gave it two tries over separate days. um, But I think that's probably my lot when it comes to Notorious. But that means it has two yeses and a no. And as such, Notorious is making the knock list. And with that revelation, the dossier on Notorious is complete and marked as classified. Uh, before we tackle what we're doing next week, Kay, thank you for joining us. Um, where can people hear more about you? Well, I have a website. Uh, it's called kwroteplay.co.uk. And uh, you can find out a little bit more about me and my writing. I don't write uh, spy stories, but I, I might in the future. You never know. So, uh, yeah, you can see some of my work on my website very good and we'll have a link to that in the show notes for people that want to check it out thank you i don't think we have the same audience <laughs> <laughs> hey you might get an influx of panto uh, I, uh lovers hey if, if they don't like the panto they can come for the filth that's my slogan that's my slogan yeah. if it's not panto. now it should be now it should definitely be now <laughs> come for um, the panto stay for the filth yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah that actually works yeah. Um, and I also want to take a quick second to send some love to a chap on Twitter called Jason. And he is a massive supporter of the show. He's always retweeting our posts and things like that. Um, you can find him at Nerdrovert, N-E-R-D-R-O-V-E-R-T. He's a great guy. And we just want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jason. We really appreciate it. Um, right, so Cam, what are we doing next week? Well, Scott, we're leaving 1946 behind and we're jumping to 2012. And we are going to talk about The Born Legacy starring Matt Damon. Oh, wait, sorry, not Matt Damon, Jeremy Renner. Ah, uh, yes, the franchise killer himself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever seen it, so I am actually quite interested to go back and watch it. Yeah, it's going to be exciting um, to uh, actually track it this close together because Bourne films, I always left, you know, obviously a couple of years between watching Bourne films in theaters, but to see them all close together, I'm interested in seeing the trajectory of this franchise. Wasn't 2012 the same year as Men in Black 3 as well? Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah there we are. Right, so your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to check out Bourne Legacy and join us next week. And you can find us on social media, of course, at SpyHards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, good luck on the hunt for the Unica Key.